scripture comes from Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases at the, as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The word of the Lord. It's really an honor to be with you today. I will give you my squinty grin in these lights. Hi. Let me get settled here. Would you join me in prayer before I begin? Oh, Lord, thank you. You have met us here already this morning. Thank you for the faithful leadership of the staff of spiritual development and of these students who are so uniquely gifted by you. And I pray that this morning, um, any of my words that are a distraction or silliness, which surely some will be, uh, that you would cause those to drift away from our minds and that we would, uh, whatever happens, be pointed more closely to your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. In this section of the Sermon on the Mount that we encountered this morning, Jesus gives directions on almsgiving, that is kind of giving to charitable causes, giving to people in need, on prayer and fasting, and we often focus on its restrictions for how we are supposed to engage those. Um, we're not to give in a showy way. We're not to pray in ways that seek to express our eloquence. We're not to fast in, in ways that um, aim to get, garner pity from others, right? And that focus on altering our behaviors is right. Those guidelines are meant to shape the way Christ's followers express our faith. So in this season of Lent, it's probably a really good thing for us to pause and take notice of the vast ways, I'm guessing, in which we fall short of living up to Jesus' instructions to us here. So we're going to start with that. And I'm tempted to take a show of hands here, actually. So if you feel so led by the Spirit, go ahead. But um, how many times have you found yourself seeking approval from other people for, for your giving, for your generosity? Anyone? Is it just, oh, you're actually participating. Good. Yes. <laughs> Um, when you give a charitable gift, say like an online crowdsourcing sort of thing, do you click the leave my donation anonymous or are you like, no, please, Kara in San Diego gave this, you know, do you do that sort of thing or is it just me? Um, 
If you hand a package of socks and toiletries to a person who lives on the street, do you expect an expression of gratitude, like a thanks would be nice for that, thank you? Um, or do you report your good deed to friends, maybe feigning a bit of casualness, yeah, like I just carry around some things with me to give, you know, no big deal. Um, if you can say yes to any of these, as I certainly can, then maybe we need to reread Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which tells us, but when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Now, moving on to the next section where Jesus restrains the way we pray, as a minister and Bible professor, I'm particularly offended here, okay? I'm just going to say that. Um, Praying in front of my classrooms and truly praying in concern for the students in light of the day's scripture readings, in light of world events, that's, these are a means of grace for me. I love doing that. I also care about words and how the words we use shape our imaginations and point us to Jesus. And so when Jesus says, when you're praying, do not heap up empty, empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. When Jesus instructs us about how to pray afterward, we may think the Lord's Prayer sounds pretty fancy. It includes language like hallowed and thy and thine, right? But that's simply because we as a church have for some reason decided to stick with that passage only to the King James Version. We've... we've Line in the sand, 1611 or nothing for me, folks. Um, but this prayer is actually really a bare bones phrase, a, a set of phrases, acknowledging God is absolute and God's rule in our lives, and then asking for really the basic things of what we need. It doesn't say, give me that car with fast acceleration or what. I don't, it's, I shouldn't have used cars. I know nothing about cars, so I can't even name can't even name anything. That Toyota minivan, don't, uh, it doesn't ask for that. That's actually, that's my dream car right now. Okay, anyway. <laughs> that proves I'm in a different life stage than many of you here. Okay. <laughs> this is really a bare bones prayer that asks for our most basic needs and asks that God would help conform us to his way, that we would live as citizens of God's kingdom, not the kingdom of this world. It's really asking that in the most basic ways. And so, Again, I find myself convicted. My prayers, my words often are meant to impress you, to impress students and to impress others. <sighs> this is hard. And let's not even, well, we are going to get into fasting, okay? But I'm warning you here, I have broken every rule that Jesus lays out about fasting here. Um, I've got stories, and I am going to tell you some of those stories but as a warning, if you were positively inclined toward me in any way, these stories are going to make me sound like a huge jerk, okay? Um, I do not come off as a hero, not even likable, okay? So prepare yourselves. But confession is a central part of the Lenten season, and so here we go. I'm confessing for you here. So first of all, I think we as a culture, I think this isn't just me, um, but I am not inclined to fasting at all. That doesn't fit with my personality. I'm more one of like, yes, I will have another donut and not, no thank you, okay? <laughs> but, okay. Uh, but when I was a freshman, I had heard some sermons about how fasting demonstrates devotion to God, about how God responds to our willingness to give things up in a, in a unique way. And so um, when I was faced with a serious concern for a friend, and I really was concerned about her. I was worried about her unhealthy relationship and some of the choices she was making. Any words of logic or kind of like advice that we would give her kind of fell on deaf ears. And so I decided, okay, I've heard about this fasting thing. Now's my time. And so it was dinner time on campus. I was on a college much like but uglier than this one. And um, it was dinner time. And so my friends were gathering to go to the dining hall. And I did the whole mournful, solemn face like, no, no. I can't go with you tonight. I'm fasting. <laughs> and I'm sure if they're good friends, they would have said things like, oh, well, can we bring something back for you from, like, there's good cookies in the dining hall, which I usually would say yes to, but no. No, I'm sure I said no to those, okay? 
And I walked back solemnly to my dorm room, my stomach grumbling with echoes of holiness, really. (laughs) And I dimmed the lights, spread out a blanket on the floor, and got on my knees and prayed. I want to be compassionate to freshman Kara. Um, I really did care about my friend, and I really did love God. But at the same time, there's something really laughable about freshman Kara, too, because I never prayed on my knees, like, ever. And so, but this occasion was the one in which I needed to really perform my devotion in the quiet of my room. I, it felt more spiritual in some way. So I prayed, and I cried, or at least I tried to cry, I'm guessing. <laughs> read some psalms, prayed some more, read a devotional. Time was going pretty slowly, and I was hungry, okay? But that's all I really remember of that, other than I know that the next day I checked in with my friend. Pretty sure that that fasting investment was going to pay off quite rapidly. How's it going? Any relationship news? You know, that sort of thing. And I was disappointed to hear that she was still going strong with this person unresponsive to my prods or my worries toward her. Well, what was all that fasting for, if not to bring a swift and supernatural change to my friend's life? But I was undeterred. This first first, um, foray into fasting didn't um, disappoint me, and so I did attempt some different fasts in years to come. You know, um, during the Lenten season, I was becoming acquainted with this ancient Christian practice of giving something up, of, of self-denial in service, of um, a focus and leading up toward um, the cross. And so I'd give something up, maybe spending excess money or um, meat. One year I gave up meat and would, when I fell asleep in class, and I did fall asleep in class, I would um, dream about chicken nuggets that year. Um, <laughs> I don't even like chicken nuggets that much, but that's what I dreamed about. (laughs) As time went on, I went to seminary, and I really did grow to cherish not just the performance of Lent and of Ash Wednesday, um, but I cherished this, this season in which we focus on our own mortality, our own sinfulness, um, and I loved the imposition of ashes on Ash Wednesday. But Okay, I'm just making sure it's, the picture's not up there yet. Okay, I'm warning you. Embarrassment is going to come. My face is going to get redder than it is now. So here we go. This was in a time that Instagram didn't exist. Smartphones didn't exist yet, okay? And so, um, and social media was um, a thing that I was not yet engaged in, but my then boyfriend, now husband, <laughs> I know, isn't he great? Yes. Um, <laughs> He introduced me to this website called Flickr. Anybody familiar with Flickr at all? So people would upload like artsy pictures, and it was really the first time that I engaged in like web commenting and stuff, and you could like things or whatever, um, and tag photos and put them in albums. And I got really into Flickr, and um, this last week I, I decided I need to go back and look at it, and I gained access to my long dormant account that's there. And I realized two things. Number one, I was a very early adopter of the selfie, and so I'd like to take some credit for really pioneering that art form. <laughs> um, but secondly, and this part, of, this is the embarrassing part, that I posted a series of really awkwardly moody um, Ash Wednesday photos on Flickr. Oh, there I am. 2007 in all my glory. There you go. Um, oh, my word. Okay. But her ash game is on point, is it not? (laughs) What on earth did I think this photo was doing, right? How did I miss that in every way I was literally defying Jesus' instructions about fasting? Uh, Jesus says, and whenever you fast, do not look dismal. Mm, Okay. (laughs) Do not look dismal like the hypocrites. Oh, there we go. Uh, For they disfigure their faces so as to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put on oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is in secret will reward you. 
Now hear me clearly, I don't think that the ancient Christian practice of imposing ashes on our face goes against Jesus saying at all. In fact, that's not what Jesus is prohibiting. It is the hamming up of these minor sacrifices and showing them off, showing this deprivation off to garner pity that Jesus has in mind. In fact, he doesn't even say that showing other people you're fasting or telling them is bad. He simply says that you get what you're asking for. And so if your behavior is asking to be noticed, being pitied, admired by people, you'll get that. But if you're seeking to show allegiance to God, your behavior will be different. My solemn black and white forehead and mournful eye shot that I posted to social media, can we go to the black and white one? It got what it was asking for, which was not favor from God, but was apparently 2,149 views and nine comments on Flickr. Oh, I know, so famous, yeah. (laughs) I'm guessing that none of us can read these statements in the Sermon on the Mount and leave feeling vindicated about our practices on almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. Maybe you've never done something as egregious as me, but unless we're simply never doing it, never giving charitably, never praying, never fasting, then we've probably found ourselves stumbling into Jesus' prohibitions here. As an important side note, Jesus doesn't list these things as optional. You'll notice he doesn't say if you fast or if you pray, but whenever you do these things. When you find yourself doing these, here is how you are to to enact those acts of devotion. And so this self-critical way that I've engaged in here of reading these statements, it's not wrong. These behaviors, they evidence where our true values lie. Are we seeking approval from other people? Or are we doing right because God is the God of righteousness? Are we doing right because we are being formed by the Spirit to live in Christ-shaped ways, live lives of generosity and self-giving? We need to constantly remind ourselves to whom our worship is due. Idolatry comes at us in sneaky ways. It seeks to displace God from the throne and to prop up human approval, self-congratulation, and self-justification in its place. The instruction in Matthew 6.1 guides this whole passage. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. If Lent and our engagement with these challenging texts remains, though, in this realm of just focusing on human failure, as I have so far, where is the good news? Where is the hope? Where is the grace? Where is God in that? There has to be more to reading this scripture than just stopping with our failures. And so one way we can walk away from this chapel shaped by our encounter with the gospel text is to commit to giving generously, praying, and fasting as a way of of living a kingdom-shaped life, one that does not seek the approval of the earthly kingdom, but of God's. But even further, laws in the Old Testament, and these here, these are laws here in the Sermon on the Mount, they seek to form a distinctive people, not for our benefit alone. It's not solely about how we behave, but in ways that reflect the character of God. These are meaning to reveal to us the kind of God we worship. And the more I think and pray through these instructions about Jesus, the more I realize that where we maybe need to be most shaken up is not being self-critical about our failures in these, in these avenues, but in our understanding of God. I want to read a quote from my college theology professor, Diane LeClaire, who teaches out at the previously mentioned less beautiful but similar school. Um, she is amazing. Here's what she says. If we're not careful... We can make assumptions about who and why we worship. It is a great temptation even today to think of God as pagans thought of their gods, namely that God demands our worship as some sort of mollifying appeasement. We worship to placate an angry God so that we will not be punished. Alternatively, it is too easy to do our version of rain dances, believing that we can please God enough in our worship, then blessings will rain down upon us. Thus, We distort the face of God and make destructive conclusions about God's nature. Our passage today uses language of reward. There are a couple Greek terms behind that one that the English translates as reward, but it does contrast the reward of public acclaim um, versus the reward that comes from God. And it can make us think 
that we are going to get some monetary reward. Right? When we hear your father who sees in secret will reward you, your father who sees in secret will reward you again and again, we might think, oh, we are doing this to earn something from God. But notice, if it's parallel at all, if the reward we receive from God is parallel at all to the human reward, it's simply notice, right? If we do these things to gain a human reward, it's just being noticed. And so maybe that's the kind of reward we are to expect from God. Maybe it's something else, something that we need. After all, God knows our needs before we ask him. But if if we're thinking at all about reward in terms of monetary gain or comfort or prevention of harm coming our way, that probably says more about us than it does about God. What this passage says in no uncertain terms about God is that our devotion never talks God down from wanting to hurt us. Neither are we entering into some like binding contractual agreement with God, this quid pro quo. Okay, I will behave in these ways. I will give this to charity if you then do this in my favor, God. Generous giving, prayer and sacrificial self-devotion, like fasting, these things matter to God. God takes notice and delights in our authentic participation in kingdom activities. And yet, doing them doesn't somehow change the accounting of of God's favor somehow, moving things, moving debts from our ledger onto God's side or something, if we only pray a certain number of prayers or something. Just like my fasting over my friend's ugly relationship situation, our acts of piety aren't just like coins we put into a heavenly um, snack dispenser or something that issue out miracles. The results are not guaranteed. And in this season of Lent, and really year-round, we would do well to practice caution. And here I'm talking about caution, about what we claim to know about God and God's ways in this world. We've really domesticated and diminished our Lord when we think that simply by demanding something in prayer, be it healing, restoration, prosperity, or whatever, even good things, means that God is obligated to respond in the ways we've prescribed. We can pray in full faith, boldness even, Hebrews 4.16 tells us, approach the throne of grace with confidence. We can ask for what we need in prayer. But even so, we can't perceive of our prayer requests as some as like ordering off a menu in a restaurant. We don't always have it our way and get things on our timetable. There are two things, at least, that we really need to remember about God. First, that God loves us and desires the restoration of all things. But the second thing is that God's actions in this world will always remain mysterious to us to some degree. We are humans. We are creatures. And so when we make obedience to God something of an equation or a recipe, like um, three parts prayer, two parts self-denial, one part offering plate, and then, well, bam, God's obligated to do what we've asked. We are engaging in a pagan view of God. As Jesus says, it's the pagans that think that many flowery words or actions are going to compel their gods to act. And also because this is true, coming at this from a different angle, we also know that when we see disease, broken relationships, poverty, money trouble, unrest, suffering in the world, that we can't reverse engineer a scenario that lays blame on those people, right? We can't say, oh, you didn't have enough faith. You didn't believe hard enough or or pray the right prayers because, look, God hasn't given this to you. The God who is generous to send life-giving rain on both righteous and unrighteous, as we heard about in a previous week's sermon on Sermon on the Mount, that's not a God who's in the business of showing favoritism. God's not out to bribe our devotion by promises of contingent favor when we do so. So the next way that we encounter Jesus today and walk away changed from hearing the Sermon on the Mount is to stop bargaining with God, to stop trying to dictate divine action or manipulate God. Our adventure with God is so much richer when we admit that God is is taking the lead. We are following. And so I'd like to share another personal story, and at the outset, I'm going to reiterate that our culture is really saturated with this sort of karmic conception of what we do um, causing the the universe to respond to us in certain ways. Um, Many people of great privilege, like many Americans, like myself, my nose is running, that's weird, um, 
many people like me think of the universe in sort of a Santa Claus sort of formulation that being nice equates to getting what you had on your Christmas list. Um, and we think about that in our whole lives. And in my experience, it's really easy to know the right Christian things to say and kind of avoid the ways in which that cultural idea, that cultural idolatry that says how we address God can bind God into action, that, that sneaking um, poison, really, that's in our culture is easy to uh, avoid in our lives and to say the right Christian things and kind of ignore the ways in which that has a grip on our hearts until, until we confront a real tragedy, a loss, a grave disappointment, an obstacle that is truly beyond our control. Others I know have really had to confront what they think about God and how they, re- and how g- they perceive God to respond to them when they have lost a loved one or face serious illness themselves. For me, um, both times I've been pregnant um, have really been the sparks that shook me to re- re-look at how I perceive of God acting in the world. And so, I, again, talking about pregnancy in a room where I'm guessing the majority of you have not been pregnant, um, many of you will never be pregnant by virtue of your sex or choice. Um, and so you're, you're going to have to just take my word for it. Uh, talk about when, when I hear about my, when I talk about my firsthand experience here. But in my experience, in both of my pregnancies, I found myself defaulting to some degree of kind of magical thinking. The idea that if I say the right things, do the right action, take the right vitamins, pray the right prayers, I can guarantee that I will be safe and that my baby will be healthy. I would lay awake at night worrying about whether I'd counted the right number of fluttery movements in my uterus, right? I would rack my brain over whether, in the most recent ultrasound at the doctor, did they actually look at the chambers of the heart or did they just say they needed to? I can't remember. Maybe if I think about this right, I will fix it somehow. I don't... I don't know what I was thinking, but any story I'd hear about another child who suffered with an illness or misfortune would just rattle me, leave me deeply insecure. How can I fix this? How can I control this? How can I make this right? One day, I finally just expressed my exhaustion. I bemoaned that making my pregnancy go right seemed totally out of my control. I couldn't make this work for me. And I wondered out loud to my husband, I wonder if this baby even knows I'm out here. And that made me stop to think, what a weird question to ask, right? I was literally carrying this child in my womb, sustaining her. All of her oxygen and blood flow, all of her nourishment came from me. I was the one charged with keeping her secure in in the ways I could externally. She depended on me for everything. And I was worried about whether she knew I was there. In some ways, what did it matter what she knew or didn't know? I was still there for her. I was on her side, literally on every side of her right? And then it struck me I might be coming into a new way of thinking about God. God is our sustainer. God is the source of all we rely upon for life. God is our protector, our savior. And so if we imagine we need to say the right words or feel the right feelings or have the right emotion at the right time, somehow persuade God to be on our side, then we radically misunderstand the nature of our all-sustaining creator. As with my pregnancies, this doesn't come with guarantees that everything's going to work out the way we plan. But it does mean that God is with us, keenly attuned to us, noticing our prayers, our giving, our fasting, noticing our movements to become more aligned with the heartbeat of the kingdom. And maybe, kind of like my baby's kicks, which when I would feel them, no matter what I was doing, I would grin like a complete goofball, just like, oh, exciting. Maybe if we do anything by our prayers, our fasting, and our giving, if we can cause God to do anything, maybe it is that we make God smile as well. I'll remind you that today is Wednesday, so after the service we have prayers and availability of anointing here, but now receive this benediction. May the kingdom come that belongs to our Father in heaven whose name is holy. And may God's will be done in your lives here on earth just as it is in heaven. May you have enough to sustain you for this day. May God forgive you your debts. And may you return that gracious favor to those indebted to you. May the Lord rescue you in times of trial. 
and from every evil, and may you live as daughters and sons of God's kingdom, reflecting God's power and glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.